Millard Erickson delves into two pivotal issues in theology, the methods of discerning the biblical message and the adequacy of language to convey that message. These are termed as biblical criticism and theological language. Historically, the church viewed theology as a straightforward task. The Bible was seen as a clear record of past events and divine declarations, and theologians simply summarized its doctrines. Additionally, even though the Bible often discussed supernatural topics, its statements were believed to have tangible meaning. However, modern times have questioned these assumptions. The chapter aims to address these contemporary challenges, ensuring that theology remains a responsible pursuit. Also, Erickson discusses the new and different approaches used in examining the Bible. These include 1. Textual criticism, looks at various manuscripts to determine the original biblical text. 2. Literary source criticism, seeks to identify the literary sources of the biblical books. 3. Form criticism, tries to identify the oral traditions that went into the written sources. 4. Redaction criticism, studies the ways biblical authors shaped and modified their material. 5. Historical criticism, uses various methodologies plus archaeology to determine authorship, timing and what really happened historically in the Bible. 6. Comparative religions criticism, traces the development of Judeo-Christian faith, typically moving from polytheism to monotheism. 7. Structural criticism, examines the deeper, implicit structures of the biblical writing. 8. Reader response criticism, focuses on the reader's interpretation of the text, rather than the text itself. This type of analysis, Erickson stresses, is crucial as it addresses the relationship between the Bible's content and historical reality. The methodology and assumptions in the analysis profoundly impact theological conclusions. However, the book's focus is limited to the New Testament, particularly the Gospels, and newer forms of criticism, as a comprehensive examination of both Testaments would require multiple volumes. This focus gives a glimpse into the biblical study behind the biblical texts being cited. Moreover, form criticism emerged as a next step from source criticism, intending to investigate the pre-literary or oral phase within biblical tradition's growth. Initially focused mainly on the synoptic Gospels, form criticism has since been extended to other parts of the New Testament and the Old Testament. Before 1900, source critics had formed an agreement around the construction of the Gospels. They proposed Mark was the first to be written, with Matthew and Luke relying on Mark and another source known as Q from the German word quell, meaning source, which was chiefly composed of Jesus' sayings. Matthew and Luke were believed to have each drawn from a unique source of material for their distinct Gospel, initially referred to as Special Matthew and Special Luke. Despite this consensus, there was an increasing belief that oral traditions formed the foundation for these written documents. Form criticism thus aimed to discover these oral foundations and chronicle their history of development. Hence, it could be referred to as Formgeschichte or form history, tracing the evolution of these oral forms. The central goal of this form of criticism was to strive beyond the written sources of the Bible's text and unravel the process of their formation and evolution in the oral tradition. In essence, form criticism seeks to bridge the gap between the written and the oral, providing a more comprehensive understanding of the Bible's historical and cultural context. This field values oral traditions, reinforcing their importance in the preservation and interpretation of religious text, underlining the significance of their position within historical timelines. It wants to dig deeper to understand where, why, and how these texts came to be. Furthermore, Erickson introduces four principles for interpreting the Gospels. The first suggests that Jesus' stories and sayings were circulated as small, independent units, pieced together by an editor into a coherent narrative. Similar stories found in different settings within the Gospels support this theory. Second, Erickson describes the classification of these units into different literary forms, derived from patterns observed in oral traditions and primitive literature. These forms may be sayings, which include parables, proverbs, prophetic utterances, laws, and personal declarations, or stories, which may be historical settings for Jesus' pronouncements, miracles, legends, corresponding to tales of saints in both Christian and non-Christian traditions, or myths symbolizing divine utterances and actions,
Thirdly, Ericsson posits these classified units can be arranged into strata based on their relative ages, with the earlier material considered more historically authentic. By analysing the communal influences at the time of recordings, we can guess at which stage a particular element entered the tradition. For example, Jesus' parables are considered older and more authentic compared to their interpretations and applications, which may have come later from the Church. Similarly, the Jewish miracles like healings and exorcisms may be more authentic than the nature miracles, which reflect later Hellenistic interest. In addition, Erickson suggests the Gospels can reveal the setting in life, sits im Leben, of the early Church, its challenges, and the corresponding elements of Jesus' sayings included to address those challenges. These sayings may even have been created and attributed to Jesus to meet the Church's needs, suggesting the Gospels reflect what the Church preached about Jesus, the kerygma, rather than a true account of Jesus' words and actions. These four principles form a critical lens for understanding and interpreting the Gospels. Further, form criticism is a critical tool that has yielded positive insights into the understanding of the Bible. As one of its significant contributions, form criticism has shown the profound linkage between Jesus' deeds and words featured in the Gospel messages and the faith of his disciples. It communicates the idea that the Gospel authors were more inclined towards elements of Jesus' life and teachings that held religious importance. Besides, form critics assert that the Gospels stem from the congregations of believers, which contradicts the skeptical view. Instead, they depict the balance and judiciousness that emerge when collective scrutiny is applied to individual interpretations. This means that Gospels are not just an individual's interpretation, but collective wisdom. Additionally, providing insights into the early Church and its challenges, form criticism analyzes the selection and emphasis of content by the Gospel authors. It suggests that their chosen content was usually connected to the difficulties the Church was encountering at the time. Also, this method proposes that the Holy Spirit inspired the Gospel authors to record information that would be useful to the Church in the future. Moreover, form criticism can verify some of the fundamental assertions of Scripture, given that its presuppositions align with the author's perspectives and positions. It identifies that even the initially criticized elements of the tradition do not present a non-supernatural Jesus, a finding that was unexpected to some critics. Overall, form criticism provides substantial contribution to the understanding and interpretation of the Bible, enriching its theological studies. Furthermore, Erickson criticizes form criticism, an approach to biblical interpretation that aims to identify the literary form and historical context of individual pericopes, sections or stories in the Bible, due to its underlying assumptions and applications. Firstly, form criticism presumes that early Christians who documented their traditions weren't motivated by historical importance. Erickson, however, argues that they valued historical events greatly, and suggests that they would have passed on details about the context of events. Secondly, Erickson questions the assumption that the authors of the Gospels lacked historical ability and dependability. He contends that form criticism underestimates the availability of historical eyewitnesses who contributed to the formation and preservation of tradition. In addition, he considers the idea that these authors fabricated historical references for their purpose as inadmissible. Thirdly, Erickson criticizes form criticism's tendency to stratify forms, which he finds artificial and somewhat subjective. Further, he challenges the substantial influence of certain assumptions it operates under, such as late editions of miracle stories and the first emergence of explicit Christology in the Church rather than in Christ's teachings. Fourthly, Erickson remarks on a discrepancy in using a life situation, sits im Leben, as the explanation for why some content was included or excluded. Using this criterion produced some unexpected findings when comparing the Gospels with the known life situations of the early Church. Fifthly, the form criticism places authenticity where there's uniqueness. He refutes this principle, arguing that a saying can be an authentic word of Jesus even when parallels exist in the rabbinical records or the life of the early Church. Sixthly, Erickson raises the concern that form criticism disregards the possibility of divine inspiration, 
due to its focus on imminent laws governing oral traditions, thus restricting the writer to received materials. Seventhly, Erickson suggests that form criticism ignored the possibility that eyewitnesses might have made written records of what they'd observed. While Erickson appreciates the clarifying contributions of form criticism to biblical understanding, he maintains that these considerations should instill caution in relying on it to assess the historicity of the biblical material. Besides, redaction criticism is a sub-discipline that emerged after World War II, evolving from literary source, form, and tradition criticisms. It posits that the authors of the Gospels were as much theologians as they were historians, with individual perspectives that informed their writings. It was first fully applied by a group of three New Testament scholars, with Willy Markson naming the approach Redaktionsgeschichte. Redaction critics view the writers of the Synoptic Gospels as conscious theologians who manipulated content to suit their own theological objectives. They believe the authors may have added, abbreviated, ignored, or even fabricated material to align with their theological goals. Key to this view is the understanding of three sitze im Leben, or life situations, the context of Jesus' words and actions, the circumstances encountered by the early church in exercising its ministry, and the gospel writer's work and intentions in their own time. Some redaction critics, like radical form critics, suggest that the evangelists were less interested in what Jesus said or did, and more focused on crafting narratives that served their purposes. From this perspective, the Gospels largely show the unique theologies of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, more than the historical Jesus. Consequently, faith is understood not as belief in Jesus as he was, but in the image of Jesus as presented by the evangelists. A set of criteria proposed by William Walker distinguishes traditional from redactional material. Functional and linguistic factors, explanations, interpretations, summaries, foretelling of future events, introductory material, and indicators of time or place all suggest redactional origin. Despite Walker's approach that prioritizes proving material as redactional before assuming it as traditional, some critics prefer the reverse process. Additionally, Erickson lays down notable criticisms of redaction criticism as identified by R.S. Barber. Firstly, he critiques the idea that redaction criticism bestows on the gospel writers a high degree of theological depth and method, doubting their potential for such refined creativity and ingenuity. Secondly, he indicates the inherent assumption of redaction criticism that every detail in the New Testament is spoken with a unique audience and special issue in mind. Barber finds this assumption questionable as it may not apply to the entirety of the New Testament. Thirdly, he criticizes the variable application and interpretation of linguistic or stylistic criteria, citing examples of word frequency analysis, such as the Greek word tote, or the presence of phrases in Luke and Acts, but not in other Gospels. Fourthly, he disagrees with the idea that an author's theology can be derived only from editorial passages, ignoring the traditional material, which in his view maintains significant value as the editor chose to preserve it. Finally, he criticizes redaction criticism for its narrow focus on the context and motives of the evangelists, rather than considering the historical veracity of the content presented in their works. In essence, Barber takes issue with the potential misinterpretations and assumptions of the redaction criticism method, while offering alternative viewpoints for consideration. These criticisms primarily challenge the objectivity, reliability, and comprehension of redaction criticism in theological and biblical studies. Next, Erickson suggests that a judicious application of redaction criticism can have significant values, provided authenticity standards are suitably adjusted and subjective methodological assumptions are kept in check. He agrees with numerous evangelical biblical scholars who propose a restrained use of this approach, which is aligned with the inherent claims of the Bible itself. He cites Grant Osborne's three values of redaction criticism. Firstly, a robust application can disprove abusive uses of critical tools and lend credibility to the text. Secondly, it can help scholars discern the specific emphases of the evangelists. Thirdly, the use of redaction criticism tools assists in resolving synoptic issues. Erickson then adds his own, fourth value to these, by studying how individual evangelists adjusted and utilized the material they accessed, 
insights can be gained into how Christ's message can be adapted to meet diverse situations. According to Erickson, the evangelists took up interpretive tasks. They paraphrased, condensed and expanded upon Jesus' utterances, consistently adhering to his foundational teachings. Similar to how a preacher or writer tailors their content based on the audience, the evangelists maintained the essence of the tradition without distorting it. He dismisses the idea of the evangelists inventing Jesus' sayings or attributing their own thoughts to Jesus. Consequently, while we may not possess the exact words of Jesus, ipsissima verba, Erickson maintains that we do hold the core of his teachings, ipsissima vox. Also, structuralism, getting its start with Ferdinand de Saussure and Claude Lévi-Strauss, has been introduced to the critical study of the Bible, emphasizing the form or structure of the text's categories rather than their external reference. This approach, known as structural exegesis, comes from a postmodern perspective and challenges the traditional method of biblical studies. It aims to find the internal structure of the text rather than its external referent and expects to unravel multiple meanings. Looking at the text's different structures, including the author's situation, cultural structures, and the underlying deep structures like narrative and mythical structures. Contrary to traditional exegesis that deals with the author's context and societal structures, structural exegesis focuses more on these deeper structures. The interaction between narrative and mythical structures is particularly noteworthy because myths often take the form of narratives, connecting the different elementary units of myths or mythemes. Despite its unique approach, Structuralism has seen flaws that led to its evolution into semiotic and reader-response criticism. Initially, structuralism had a quasi-objectivistic optimism derived from social sciences methodology, but post-Freudian psychoanalytical scrutiny of the text blunted this optimism by highlighting the propensity for self-deception. Ambiguities about the verification and utility of structuralism's results in relation to the efforts put into it emerged as another challenge. Moreover, so many adjustments have been made to the early notions of structure that the term structuralism might no longer suit the later work as it has shifted towards more reader-oriented types of criticisms. Furthermore, Erickson discusses reader-response criticism, a pivotal approach move in biblical criticism since the late 1960s. This approach emphasizes the reader's interpretation over the inherent meaning of the text. Its postmodern methods supplement rather than succeed the historical method. Proponents argue that historical criticism can accommodate and integrate reader-centered approaches, albeit this requires adaptation from both the critic and the method itself. Stanley Fish is known as one of the most radical and influential reader-response critics. He refutes the notion that meaning rests within the text and instead argues that meaning is interpreted, shaped and constrained by the reader's community or institution. Despite being deemed radical, elements of Fish's approach have been adopted by many biblical critics and hermeneutes. The reader-response approach posits that the reader's interests influence their understanding of a text. Nevertheless, issues arise with this method. For instance, a question exists on how these methods should apply to all texts, including their own critical writings. In addition, the approach seems to dichotomize theories of meaning, setting formalist and contextual pragmatic against one another. Further, lingering doubts also remain concerning the role of community in providing objectivity, as an individual has the agency to select the community they attach to. Besides, Erickson questions the feasibility of a socio-pragmatic approach to not be more than a narrative philosophy, wherein it contains only one story among many. Critics have challenged this method for its rejection of more definitive or restrictive narratives while brandishing a disguise of liberal pluralist credentials. Thus, Erickson presents a nuanced view of reader-response theory, acknowledging its merits, but also forewarning of its potential pitfalls and limitations. Additionally, Brevard Child's approach to biblical study, known as canonical criticism, has sparked interest due to its unique perspective. Contrary to some depictions, Childs does not outright reject biblical criticism. While he appreciates and implements critical methodology, he challenges the supremacy of its results. His focus leans on the theological value and intention of the biblical text, where the relevance lies in the final canonical form of the scriptures. Childs posits that critical analysis has beneficially unearthed problems associated with the text 
which were overlooked by pre-critical and uncritical scholars, leading to a single-level reading of the text. In developing theology, Childs advocates for giving paramount importance to the final form of the canon. His standpoint stems from the belief that the final form is what, received and used as authoritative scripture by the community. He emphasizes that studying this form yields a deeper theological understanding compared to studying typical sources like J, E, D, and P. Childs aims to relate the historical past to the modern religious context through his hermeneutic. He acknowledges the possibility that the final form of the text could be influenced by factors other than theological importance. But this issue, he believes, doesn't diminish his theory's validity. He proposes resolving such issues with additional historical criticism or considering the concept of canonical intentionality. Despite its novelty, Childs's approach hasn't been universally embraced by Old Testament scholars. Still, it offers critical insight into the central purpose of Scripture, serving the Church's life and underlines how traditional critical study often reduces Scripture to a document valued primarily by detached scholars. Despite his more favorable stance on the validity of critical scholars, his primary focus aligns significantly with the issues one have critically engaged with. Next, Erickson highlights several considerations to bear in mind when examining biblical criticism. Firstly, he underlines the significance of being mindful of assumptions that lean towards anti-supernaturalism, such as instances where miraculous events are considered unhistorical. Also, Erickson warns against circular reasoning, often seen when critics use stories in the Gospels to reconstruct the historical context of the early church, then use said context to explain the origin of those same stories. Similarly, he expresses concern for unwarranted inferences and arbitrary, subjective interpretations that might inadvertently color critical assessments. Moreover, Erickson emphasizes the importance of scrutinizing assumptions regarding the perceived opposition between faith and reason. Furthermore, he reminds us that criticisms are ultimately probabilities rather than certainties. With each consecutive premise, the probability of the final conclusion decreases. Despite these potential pitfalls, Erickson maintains that biblical criticism, when conducted appropriately, being open to the supernatural and authentic elements of the text, can be a positive and useful process. Reputable scholars such as Joachim Jeremias have defended biblical criticism, asserting that evidence of faithfulness and respect towards the tradition in the Synoptic Gospels undermines the need for validating authenticity. In sum, Erickson champions biblical criticism as a tool that can shed further light on scriptural meanings, providing it is implemented with the correct assumptions and methods in line with the full authority of the Bible. In addition, he argues that while the Bible need not satisfy criteria of authenticity to be considered reliable, when it does meet these standards, it lends further confirmation to its dependability. Besides, Erickson delves into the critical importance of language within the church and theological discourse, emphasizing its crucial role in communication of faith. Since the genesis of the church, theologians, including Augustine, addressed the significance and function of language in theological exchanges, dissecting the inherent nature of these verbal instruments in communicating divinity. The 20th century brought about a sharper focus into the examination of language, predominantly inspired by philosophical discourses which often parallel with theological dialogues. In this era, philosophy began to prioritize and devote immense attention to linguistic analysis, introducing a fresh layer of urgency into the investigations of theological language. It was this quantum leap in the examination of language, alongside the vital role theological language plays in the Church's mission, that compelled the Church to not only maintain an interest in its own language, but to maintain an urgency in understanding and navigating this complex landscape of theological language. Thus, the work discusses the transparent and profound implications of language within the Church, reinforcing that words are essential for a robust and effective exchange of vital theological knowledge. It serves to reiterate that language is not a mundane tool, but rather a dynamic medium which the Church should employ carefully in its theological communications. It is a cogent reminder of the importance of language in realizing the Church's mission of disseminating its invaluable teachings. It underlines the Church's continuing effort to effectively understand, adapt, and enhance its theological communicative skills. Additionally,
logical positivism, which arose in the early 20th century, has been dealing with the theory of meaning. It differentiates between two types of cognitive propositions. The first type is a priori, analytic statements which are necessarily true yet uninformative about the empirical world. An example would be 2 plus 2 equals 4. The second type is synthetic statements, which can have either truth value and their accuracy can be proven or disproven through observing the real world. An example would be all bachelors are tall. According to logical positivism, the meaningfulness of a statement depends on whether it is verifiable or falsifiable through sense data. Analytic statements define terms while synthetic ones can be verified or falsified. A statement can be meaningful even if it's false, as long as it's verifiable or falsifiable. The problem arises when dealing with many theological statements which aren't verifiable or falsifiable. Take, for example, God is a loving father. This statement can't be tested empirically and thus is considered nonsense under the rules of logical positivism. Instead of communicating factual information, theology and philosophy are perceived by logical positivists as expressions of one's feelings. However, the verifiability principle, tentpole of logical positivism, was criticized for discarding traditional uses of language that are found meaningful and serviceable in ethical and religious context. Also, the verifiability principle itself is neither an analytic statement, nor can it be verified or falsified empirically, meaning that by its own criteria, it's meaningless. This resulted in a contemporary philosophical shift away from logical positivism's original form towards a more accommodative or revised interpretations. Moreover, Erickson discusses the evolution of analytical philosophy towards functional analysis, a term coined by Frederick Ferre, in which the aim shifted from prescribing how language should be used to describing how it is used. The proponents of functional analysis seek to interpret language within its specific context of use and function, identifying its purpose, its validity, and the characteristics and roles it performs. Esteemed philosopher Wittgenstein called this array of different uses of language language games, emphasizing that language is indeed an activity, varying from commands to prayers, from reports to jokes. Each of these language games abides by its own particular rules, and confusion usually stems from not recognizing the switch between these game forms or attempting to apply the rules of one game to another. This misapplication of rules is referred to by functional analysts as a category transgression and is considered a misuse of language. For instance, treating theological statements concerning divine creation as empirical statements about the origin of the universe amounts to a category transgression, as it marks a switch from a theological language game to an empirical one. The role of the philosopher in this context, according to the proponents of functional analysis, is to permit theologians to explicate religious language and subsequently assess whether the explanation given is appropriate. Furthermore, the philosopher determines whether the language is being correctly or incorrectly used, that is, whether any category transgressions are being made. This approach is a clear departure from earlier philosophies that aim to dictate what language is and does. In addition, Erickson addresses the criticism of theological language as meaningless by asserting its nature as personal language. He draws upon the work of theologian William Horden to elaborate this concept. Horden posits that religious and theological language parallel personal language, signifying a blending of our expression about God and other individuals. Thus, the language used to describe God is not simply analogous to that used for humans, but shares common attributes with it. Critical to Horden's understanding of theological language is the concept of revelation. Just as our knowledge and perception of others stem from their self-disclosure, Understanding a personal God is contingent upon his self-revelation. God, therefore, is known through his disclosure of himself, yet Erickson acknowledges drawbacks within Horden's interpretation. For instance, the comparison between God-oriented and person-oriented language fails, since our sensory perception of humans doesn't extend to God. Further, it remains unclear how our language about God evolves from our relationship with him. Thus, while Erickson highlights theological language's inherent qualities of personal language, he also recognizes ambiguity in details like the impact of our relationship with God on our expression about him. Besides, Erickson discusses John Hick's acceptance of the verifiability principle 
along with his attempt to retain significance for Christianity's language through the concept of eschatological verification. This concept argues that while we may not currently have confirmation for our theological claims, we will eventually receive it. However, Erickson points out several issues with this perspective. Firstly, the question arises as to what exactly this eschatological occurrence means as an empirical one. Secondly, there is ambiguity about how we will experience God sensationally in the future if we are not doing so presently. Hicks' view, despite its novelty, possesses limitations. Erickson indicates two other approaches within the functional analysis model that potentially provide better understandings of theological language. Additionally, Erickson explores the concept of theology as a cognitive, truth-bearing discipline. He believes theological discourse refers to metaphysical facts, presenting a conceptual synthesis of reality. For Erickson, this metaphysical knowledge represents a worldview, a cohesive system through which to understand and interpret experiences. He supports Frederick Ferret's argument that all individuals have a worldview regardless of its sophistication. Also, Ferret argues that one can evaluate these worldviews, assessing their strengths and weaknesses. Erickson delves into Ferret's general theory of signs, which concerns the semantics, syntax, and interpretation of signs. He sees this triadic method as a requisite process in comprehending Christian theology as a metaphysical conceptual synthesis. Moreover, Erickson highlights that Ferret views metaphysics as less about proving absolute truths and more about weighing a system's strengths against its weaknesses. There are criteria to assess a metaphysical system's validity, splitting into two classes, internal and external. The first internal criterion, consistency, stipulates a lack of contradiction among the system's symbols. The second, coherence, requires interrelatedness and unity within the system. External criteria include applicability, which demands an accurate interpretation of reality and adequacy, implying that the system can, in theory, account for all experiences. Erickson challenges the assumption that universally accepted criteria do not exist, suggesting that common sense notions are widely used in practice. He concludes Christian theology's cognitively meaningful language carries the status of a metaphysical system, with its truthfulness testable through the application of these criteria. Furthermore, theological language, as explained by Erickson, is considered to be cognitively meaningful and marked by two elements of meaning, an easily perceived empirical reference and a deeper objective meaning that requires interpretation or discernment. Drawing on Ramsey's theories, Erickson likens theological discourse to a complex mosaic where one can either focus on individual components or try to discern the larger picture conveyed by these components. Similarly, theological language often presents obvious empirical references as well as concealed objective meanings. Regarded as a complex system of metaphors, Theological language requires interaction and active involvement by the interpreting human mind to sense deeper, often spiritual, layers of meaning. Using the example of the term new birth, Erickson argues that theological language can be paradoxical and may require seemingly incorrect grammar or unconventional communication tools like riddles and puns to convey the unearthly, boundless sense it bears. Significantly, the task of discerning and comprehending such language is more spiritual than analytic due to the potential involvement of the Holy Spirit in facilitating the human mind to grasp deeper insights. In addition, the ultimate purpose of theological language is not merely to convey and elucidate abstract religious or metaphysical ideas, but to inspire commitment towards these ideas. All in all, while theological language might seem bewildering and open-ended, it is a critical tool in facilitating the metaphysical synthesis of religious experiences or direct revelations from God, according to Erickson. Meaning in theological language is not isolated, but part of a larger metaphysical context, bridging the sensory world with the deeper spiritual realm. Last but not least, speech act theory, the third stage of the 20th century philosophical treatment of language, views utterances as actions rather than states of things, Influenced by John Austin, this perspective was further developed by John Searle, who classified speech acts into utterance acts, propositional acts, and illocutionary acts. The aim of this new approach was to analyze what the spoken or written sounds are intended to achieve and differed from previous theories, since it allowed a broader assessment of a speech act rather than merely true or false.
Thistleton applied this framework to hermeneutics and found that speech act theory was able to illumine the real meaning of several puzzling scriptural passages. The McCartneys used it to describe how religious communities communicate with one another. They evaded relativism by arguing that all reasoning comes from an established conviction. Despite the helpfulness of speech act theory in understanding religious language, limitations in understanding broad human agreement and specific religious experiences remain. Further, Van Hooser modified the speech act theory by analyzing speech acts in terms of proposition, purpose, presence and power. He analyzed that God, revealing himself through scripture, provides a series of inscribed discourse acts and that the authority of scriptures is multifaceted. He expanded the concept of inerrancy beyond merely assertive speech acts, reiterating that all of God's messages, whatever their purpose, achieve their intentions. It's important to note that the speech act theory is most useful within a community of those who share a common religious experience. To be effective more broadly, it needs to be accompanied by discernment analysis as passed by Ramsey. Thus far, speech act theory is compatible with an evangelical understanding of theology and biblical authority and is useful in understanding the varied purposes of revelation. However, it can't resolve the issue of understanding purportedly assertive propositions that deal with claimed supersensible realities on its own. The theory's chief role lies more in hermeneutics than epistemology. In conclusion, Erickson delves into biblical criticism, theological language, and different methods of interpreting and understanding the biblical message. Analyzing eight types of biblical criticism, Erickson explores the relationship between the Bible's content and historical reality, and the impact of methodology and assumptions on theological conclusions. He connects different ways of interpreting the Gospels, from traditional analysis to form criticism, redaction criticism, structuralism and reader response criticism, detailing their strengths, weaknesses and the potential pitfalls of misguided application. While affirming the usefulness of biblical criticism, Erickson insists upon careful, responsible application guided by proper assumptions in alignment with the full authority of the Bible. Besides, Erickson's discussion extends to the topic of theological language, specifically its role in conveying faith and the crucial need to understand, adapt, and enhance the Church's communicative skills. He discusses Horden's concept equating theological language to personal language and proceeds to examine Hicks' concept of eschatological verification. Erickson then outlines Ferret's criteria for evaluating the validity of a metaphysical system, arguing that theological language is cognitively meaningful, akin to a metaphysical system, with its truthfulness verifiable through these criteria. Additionally, he elaborates on the function of theological language like a mosaic, referencing empirical facts as well as deeper objective meanings, using unconventional communication tools to convey spiritual layers of meaning. Lastly, Erickson scrutinizes various theories and their application or potential contributions to hermeneutics and epistemology. Erickson appreciates the epistemological implications of speech act theory, although cautions this theory's usefulness within a broader community remains uncertain without discernment analysis.